Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gail Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Heidi Tissenbaum. Dr. Heidi Tissenbaum received her BS in biology from Concordia University in Montreal and her master's degree in physiology from the University of Ottawa. She graduated with a PhD in genetics from Harvard Medical School. And from 1997 to 2001, Dr. Tissenbaum was a postdoc at MIT, where she was supported by the Helen Way Whitney Foundation. In 2001, Dr. Tissenbaum joined the program in gene function and expression at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and also received a career award in biomedical sciences from the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Dr. Tissenbaum has received funding from the American Federation of Aging Research, the Worcester Foundation for Biomedical Research, the Concern Foundation, and the National Institute of Aging. We are so excited that you're here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So welcome, Heidi. And uh, for a, a background for our audience, uh, me and uh, Heidi spent time uh, at the Lab of Lenniger Renter. And uh, not at the same time, but I remember when I came to interview at the lab, uh, Heidi was a, a very nice person to discuss and uh, to learn more about the lab. So Heidi, maybe you le let our audience uh, know a bit about the early days of the Garante lab. How was it? Uh, what, uh, what was the environment in the lab at that time? Okay, so I actually interviewed at Lady Garante's lab in 1995. But then, is that 1995? But I actually was pregnant at the time. And so I had a baby in 1996. So I didn't join the lab till 1997. And when I first interviewed, the only person working on aging at that time was Brian Kennedy. And by the time I joined, there was a handful of people working on longevity. And Lenny's lab at the time was still split between transcription and longevity. And it was really the early days. We really didn't know very much at that time. We knew that in many lower organisms, you could manipulate genes and affect lifespan, but that's about all we knew. And so it was a rather exciting time to be in the lab. There was also a lot of inter-lab competition because everyone in the lab was looking for the next great thing. And that's the way it was. It was very competitive, but very positive as well. Thank you, Heidi. And let's go back a bit and learn a bit about your background and the moment that you realized that you want to be scientist. When was it? So I, I grew up in a family where my father was a physician and my mother was a nurse and they met at a hospital. And then my older brother was also a physician. So. I had always thought I wanted to be a physician, but I didn't get into medical school right away after my bachelor's degree. So I decided to do research for two years at the University of Ottawa. And then I got into medical school. But at that time, I was just so excited by doing research. And I sat with my father and he said, you know, can you handle dealing with people when they're dying, when they're sick? And I thought, all I would do is cry. And so that's not very helpful. So I decided to go into research because I liked research. And I knew I could handle things. I also, during my master's, dealt with mice. And at that point, I decided I can't deal with things that have blood. 
So I decided to pursue lower model organisms for my future research. So I did. It sounds like you couldn't work at Insta Tracker because uh, we are the vampires. We are always taking blood. So. <laughs> but you're doing something very, very important, which is advancing health and getting people to think about their own health. And to me, that's really where the longevity field has moved. So when I started, you know, we isolated individual genes that affected lifespan. But over the course of, let's say, 25 years or so, we moved beyond that. And we moved into how can we affect our health or our health span? And I think that's very important what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ashley, please uh, continue with the questions. Yeah. And thank goodness phlebotomy is not a requirement to work at Inside Tracker because I couldn't do that either. <laughs> Would you mind walking us through your career path? So after your postdoc at MIT, how did you ultimately you know, kind of end up where you are now, celebrating 20 years at the University of Massachusetts with a focus really continued on aging? Okay, so I'll start at the beginning, which is when I was a graduate student, I was interested in a gene that affected development at the time. And then Cynthia Kenyon showed that that gene, which is called DAF2, D-A-F-2, was important for lifespan. So all of a sudden I realized I was working on lifespan slash aging. And then I just stayed with it. And at the time, when I was looking for postdocs, I went to a meeting and Lenny talked, and Lenny was there, Lenny Garanti, and he talked about aging. And it was so exciting that I just had to go to his lab. And so I went there and stayed there for four years, got a good paper, got my position at UMass. And it's been, you know, I climbed to full professor in the first 10 years I was there. And now it's just been uh, enjoyable. I mean, as far as the aging field goes, I think I'm one of the people that was there right at the beginning. And, you know, we've spent years and years isolating individual genes that mutate to affect lifespan. But I would say maybe in the last five years or so, or maybe a little longer, five to 10 years, we've pushed to move to altering health or health span. And in my opinion, if you invite, if you divide life, your life in three parts, you have your early development and your death, the middle part. And I think the focus of, of research in the aging field has gone to move that middle age. You know, can we be more healthy and live better and prolong the time before we get age-associated disease? So, so I, um, I think that uh, you selected a very fascinating uh, model organism, the C. elegans or the round worms. And I'm not sure that our audience uh, understand uh, or know about them. I think that it's the first time for us discussing this model organism. So can we, you please give us a background about uh, this uh, organism? Sure. Why is it important for aging? Uh, what, uh, what is known about it? And uh, so on. Okay. So C. elegans is a hermaphrodite roundworm. And all the work is really done under a microscope because they're only about a millimeter long. And you think, why would I study that for aging research? Well, there are some very good reasons. The first is that several people who got the Nobel, Nobel Prize for this mapped out development of the animal. And so that means they know from the first get-go, when it's a zero-cell, one-cell embryo, when it divides, they know what cell, the division that makes one cell different from another. So now you could start to ask, what genes make a muscle cell versus a nerve cell? And the whole animal is only 959 cells. So you could really ask a lot of questions. 
For aging research in particular, the animal only lives three weeks. And many people know we want to keep animals alive for a long time. And so it's very inexpensive and easy to maintain. And so that's the reason I think it's been a primary system for aging research because it has a short, very reproducible lifespan. And so everyone uses the same starting strain, the wild type strain. And the lifespan really varies from about 15 to 18 days at 20 degrees. And within your own group, the lifespan is pretty much the same. And so now you can isolate things that, you know, affect lifespan by as little as 10 to 15 percent, and you'll see a significance. Whereas if the lifespan was variable and was anywhere from like 8 to 20 days, you would either get mutations that make the worm live very, very short or very, very long. But that short reproducible lifespan has been a huge advantage for aging research in C. elegans. And can you walk us through maybe the first pathway that was shown to be able to increase lifespan in C. elegans? Sure. So this is work that I was part of when I was a graduate student in Gary Rumpkin's lab. So he was the real Per, you know, his lab, really, we cloned many of those genes. Cynthia Kenyon's lab also cloned one of the genes in the pathway. But the first, very first gene that we isolated was a gene called age one And age one had been shown to affect development or uh, basically worms could form a spore-like state. And... When we cloned age one, this was part of a team I was on at Gary's lab, we identified it as a PI3 kinase. So the catalytic subunit of an enzyme that had been shown to be important in regulation of insulin primarily. And then within six months, we cloned another gene in the pathway, DAF2, that I talked about that had been linked to lifespan And that was an insulin receptor. So now we started to think we had a pathway. And sure enough, the third gene we cloned was uh, a transcription factor that was downstream. DAF16, that wasn't part of the pathway. And what was beautiful for us was age one, DAF2, and DAF16 were genetically already in a separate pathway. So when we cloned all three, we put them in an insulin, insulin-like pathway. And why I say insulin-like is because DAP2 is both related to human insulin receptor and human IGF-1 receptor. So it's known as insulin-like. So that was really the first pathway. But what was really gratifying to myself was that Within 10 years, people had shown, Brad Wilcox mainly, had shown that the FOXO we showed important for lifespan in C. elegans was important in human longevity. And to date, I think FOXO3, which is what it's called, is probably the most, but probably the only human gene that really has shown again and again to be linked to human lifespan extension. So super interesting. It's, I don't know. Was there some luck involved with those three choices or was there, you know, you specifically knew what you were looking for? It sounds like, you know, you lucked out with a bit in that pathway. Well, so uh, Yes and no. I mean, Cynthia Kenyon in 1993 published a paper that the DAF2 gene, which we showed was a receptor, was involved in longevity. And then we showed genetically that the H1 gene and the DAF16 gene were also regulating longevity as opposed to other genes that affected development. 
So we were really like in a race to clone those genes because we were really curious. And that was the main part of my graduate thesis. So we got it's crazy it. That it so, it's crazy that it's already almost 30 years since the, uh, uh, the DAF2 was uh, uh, identified. Uh, it's really crazy. It showed that we are getting older. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Or I don't know. I mean, you know, the truth is, yes, that was our first cloning was 1995, I believe. 1996, 97, I think that too came out in 97, but, or 96, I don't remember. But the truth is that where have we gone since then? I think that we still don't understand how the insulin-like pathway really regulates longevity in the context, in the 3D context of an animal. I don't think we're there yet. And I think that people's interests have moved beyond mechanistic interests. We're really interested in, in the output and we're not so interested in mechanism or anything. I think that the longevity field really wants to get something that affects health, that improves health, that improves the onset of disease and mechanistically I don't think we understand things so that's where I'm at but unlike other people I've stayed working in Seattle this whole time that's just my interest and is there other than that 10 to 15 percent increase in 15 to 18 day lifespan are there other markers that you can measure in the elegans related to longevity, or is it is it mostly just those ex, you know that extra fifteen percent from what you see in lab? So, uh, as I said before, I think the longevity field uh, has moved to improving health span, and what health span really means is that if you look at an animal throughout its life, you see markers that make it look younger than it should. And so in C. elegance, we, well, in my lab, we always publish, in addition to lifespan, a uh, marker for health, such as movement or uh, resistance to stress. Something that shows, because we did some assays a lot more than five years ago, to show that in wild type, you have phenotypes that change with age. If you have a phenotype that declines with age, now you could ask a question, is my intervention making that happen later, delaying that? And to me, that that's really what we want. So, so Heidi, uh, you mentioned the DAF2 pathway and DAF16 and H1, which is a PS3 kinase, which is very interesting. But can you ex explain to the, our audience why a, a mutation a, or overexpression of those genes actually in, increase lifespan? What is the mechanism for that? So the mechanism, you know, the mechanism is known on a, a flat sheet of paper. So you could draw an arrow from one gene to another. And so you could say that the insulin receptor, then that's on the surface of the cell, and that triggers uh, phosphorylation of it, of downstream kinases, which it's a it's a kinase cascade, meaning that there's genes that get phosphorylated, and then ultimately it negatively regulates the foxotranscription factor. So what happens is that gene or that protein basically is in the cytosol most of the time. But when DAF16 is activated, it goes to the nucleus and binds probably thousands of genes that regulate almost every stress pathway we know. And it both activates and represses genes. And that's ultimately 
why you get the lifespan and health span effects of that pathway. It's because of the transcription factor binding to important target genes. Okay, great. And then you finish your uh, postdoc at the General Rufkin Lab and move to Lenny's and started to work on the uh, CO2 family of uh, dead settlers. So can you elaborate a bit about that and how this uh, family related to longevity? And let's start with East. Okay, so the Sirtuin family, let's start uh, with yeast, was shown to be important uh, silent information regulators by Jasper Rhine, many probably in the 80s. Um, and then Matt Caberline and Mitch McVeigh, who were graduate students in Letty's lab, showed that you could actually, the Sirtuin genes were actually modulators of lifespan. And so it was 1999, and I had spent the whole summer on a project that gave me no results. So I had been a postdoc for two years, and I I remember I decided that what I was going to do for a project, uh oh, I should say that Lenny really wanted me to look at the sirtuins and them, how they could affect lifespan when overexpressed. So that was Lenny's idea. And I decided that there's no way this is going to work. So I'll do a screen, and in the screen, I'll include the sirtuins. But that's not going to work. So I'll get other hits for genes that when overexpressed affect lifespan. So I'll be all set for my career. So I did the first screen and sure enough, the only thing that worked was a gene, was an area that duplicated the sirtuin region. That's sirtuin worms. Sir T1 in humans and mammals. So in worms, there's, I should just say, there's four Sir twins, and they're called Sir 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. So this is Sir 2.1 or Sir T1. And so then I was then, Lenny was very excited and he said, You have to do the ultimate experiment. So I made a worm. I made a transgenic worm that had an extra copy of the Sirtuin gene. And I did lifespan. And Lenny kept coming. This is in his book. Lenny kept coming to my desk. What's going on? What's going on? And I didn't tell him. And to this day, <laughs> people in my lab, I do the exact same thing too. So anyways, I said I would never do that to people in the lab, but I do. So, anyways, it turned out that the overexpression of Sir 2.1 affected lifespan, increased lifespan. And that came out at the same time, or a little bit after, Shin Imai and Chris Armstrong showed the uh, acetylase activity, the NAD dependent acetylase activity of mammalian Sir 2. And that sort of started the whole sirtuin field. And to this day, I do not know why Lenny thought that would work, that going from yeast to worms would work. But he did, and that started me on the on my career. And then when I joined, when I had my own lab, we did a few experiments with sirtu, but it was very controversial. And I decided it would be better for me to just not do it anymore. So after two papers, I stopped. So I did. it's a very interesting information. I didn't know the story about Lenny coming to you and asking you to do it, and you're saying no. That's That was <laughs> a, a, a very interesting. And uh, sounds like you always learn uh, when you talk with uh, smart people. So <laughs> thank you so much for that information. Thank you for telling me I'm smart. <laughs> Do we know anything about the other three type of sirtuins that you said worms have? 
do we know what you know what their functions are? So there's been that's a good question. There's been intermittent reports that's one's a mitochondrial, one infects the FOXO DEF sixteen. But there because of this the controversy that still goes whether SIR2 really affects lifespan or not in C. elegans and in Drosophila. There's been some controversy about that. So because of that, I think people have sort of stayed away. And now maybe people will start again. So that's about it. I mean... I don't know if you want me to go into the whole controversy because I seem to do that. Uh, the aging field, I have to say, for myself, I just follow the research. I start with a question, and whatever question I'm interested in, whatever the results are, that's what I publish. And that has gotten me in quite a few uh, controversies because people have their because people might have different opinions about what goes on. So, for example, we published in 19, in sorry, in 2015, we did some health span work where we took long-lived worms, so the DAF2 gene I showed, and three other mutations that have been shown to live long, and we measured how they lived for very related to their lifespan. And we measured how well they move, how well they respond to stress. And we found that these long-lived worms spend a lot of time not moving and in a kind of decrepit state. And... You know, at first I was met with a lot of controversy, but since then, at least one lab, Cynthia Kenyon's lab, has shown that our results are correct, and and that's what happens. And so it's really unclear why you get a mutation where animals are kind of decrepit for movement and stress, but show positive benefits and other parameters like learning and memory and some other things. So, you know, the worm is great because you can analyze many, many different phenotypes for a single mutation. Hmm. But that's pretty much what we found and one of the controversies which I found myself in. <laughs> well, kind of maybe... Hopefully not piggybacking on that too much, but in a lot of your publications, as we talked about before, you're pretty intentional about including not just lifespan, but also some of these other measurements of health span. So for us, would you mind maybe speaking to the differences between those two terms and why you think it is important to make sure that both are represented? Sure. Okay. So lifespan literally is measuring how long the animal lives. And so in C. elegans, the way you do that is you take, usually you start with a larval stage four animal. So that's basically a pre-puberty animal. It's not mated to its virgin fly, if you're interested in Drosophila. So it's kind of a young adult, I would say. And you put it on a plate every day. You measure if it's alive by poking its head. And I should say that work that we did, not published, but work that we did early on showed that there's no correlation between movement and not being able to move and lifespan. Because mm. you would think that if you're tapping a worm on its head and when it moves, it's alive, then there's a caveat that movement might have an effect. That's not true. Okay. So... That's lifespan, how long the animal lives. But there's no, there's no measure of, of the quality of the animal's life. And so um, the other thing is that in aging research, people often use lifespan synonymously with aging. And clearly that's not the same. Aging is a measurement, sorry, lifespan is a measurement of the aging process. But the aging process is much more than just how long a person lives. I mean, 
all of us could look at two people the same age and what they look very different, right? Mm -hmm. And on the inside, it's probably even more different. So, but I have to say, lifespan is easy and it's something every time you do it, you get an answer. And so I love that about it because when you have new people in the lab, you tell them to do a lifespan and they get a result within a month of being in your lab. So that's very gratifying. Okay, so now we think about health and health span and people have been using this term for a long time. So what does that mean? Well, it actually means what what I think it means, and this is my opinion, is qualifying the lifespan. And so for us, what we typically do is we look at, well, what is aging? Okay, so I should say, so I should go back for a second. So how do you qualify or quantify a healthy aging or health span, right? If you type in healthy aging to Google, you'll get silver-haired people smiling, playing tennis on the computer. But there's no assay to say this is health, this is health span. And how would you do it in a worm? So we were left with this and we spent many, many months discussing. And what I thought was health would be the ability to maintain homeostasis. And so two of the assays that we do are exposing aging animals to heat and oxidative stress. And we first showed that both of those parameters decrease in wild type. And so now we measure how well or how bad an animal does compared to wild type in the same regimen. And that way we could say whether it's healthier or frail. So those are two assays that we use. The other two assays that we use are, we're fortunate for worms, this is quite easy. We do movement, so regular movement on a plate, and then we do forced movement, where we put the animal in the liquid and we ask how they respond to that. So there's four different parameters you can do. And of course, you're always comparing this to wild type because that's the only way you can know if something is healthier or more frail as they mm -hmm. age. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And some of the essay that you're doing in worms are uh, 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 fairly applicable for humans. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting to, to see the difference between, uh, not the difference, but the com uh, common between uh, worms and humans. My, my next question, uh, ID, is uh, related to uh, age one or PS3 kindness. And actually, uh, as much as I know, it's uh, also connected to the mTOR pathway, yes. which is uh, now it's, uh, let's say, the most exciting and everyone is talking about rafamycin and mTOR. So maybe ca can you describe it a bit and also uh, let's look a bit about what do we know about it in worms? Uh, I am not an expert in mTOR. We have not, I don't think we've published anything on mTOR. Um, and the reason for me is really that mTOR and this dafsuxine foxo and even the gene in worm skin one, which is a NERF2 in humans, so all of those genes, they connect, and there's a lot of crosstalk, and so we have not been involved really with that. But what we have been involved with is, what we have been involved with is uh, age one, and age one has two phosphor, no, 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 we have been involved in downstream of age one, AKT, and Age one, we haven't really been involved with. I mean, Gary Rufkin's lab found its partner, and we haven't really pursued it. The, the downstream of age one is another kindase known as AKT, and that's really 
a hub for many, many signals. And that, AKT, so and signals to Tor as well. And then mm-hmm. mTOR feeds back to AKT. And so it's very complicated in feedback of, of, of uh, Richter, which is part of the mTOR complex. Okay, cool. Um, and some, uh, uh, some activity about uh, dietary sugar and uh, uh, the impact of them on uh, the microbiota. And can, can you elaborate about that and uh, tell us what you found? Okay. Thank you for for saying that. So our most recent work is actually on dietary sugar, primarily high sugar. And the reason that we study that is because if you go into the grocery store, everything has added sugar. I mean, it's just everywhere. Um, It seems like in the 90s, when they got rid of fat, they replaced it with sugar. So everything, your milk, your yogurt, well, yogurt has a lot of sugar, Uh, cereal, bread, almost anything in a grocery store has added sugar. And so we got into, that's the reason we got into that. Uh, The amount of dietary sugar in the population has increased and it's associated with many bad things like metabolic disease. So in worms, it's actually quite easy to add dietary to add dietary glucose. That's what we usually use is dietary glucose. And what we found, okay, so let me back up. So worms sit on a plate, a plastic dish that has agar in it. And so what happened is people added sugar to the agar and so but the worms i don't know if i said this before the worms feed on e coli that's all on the agar dish so you have a plastic dish filled with agar and you put e coli on top and then you add the worm okay that's the normal setup But with sugar, what people did is, including us, is you added glucose to the agar media. And so both the E. coli and the worm were exposed to the sugar. So in my thinking, I was like, why is the worm, uh, why why are we seeing the effects on the worm? And so as you might expect, Worms eating added dietary glucose live shorter and are not very uh, healthy. Okay, so when we got the results, and many other labs have got that result, um, it started, I think, with Cynthia Kendi and, and uh, Michael Ristow's lab. So I was thinking, why are we getting reduced lifespan? Is it the sugar affecting the worm, the sugar affecting the bacteria, or the worm eating the sugary bacteria? And so uh, several years ago, we collaborated with a microbiologist at USC, Stephen Finkel, and we said, let's try to eliminate one pathway. And so what we did is we grew E. coli with glucose for three days and then fed that to the worm. So the worm never sees the glucose. They only see the sugary bacteria. And we reproduced all the phenotypes that Mm. you see when the sugar is in the plate. So in my opinion, what's happening is it's actually the sugar being metabolized by the E. coli that's giving you the effects on the worm. And how it relates to the microbiota, well, for C. elegans, they eat the E. coli, and then the E. coli becomes their microbiota. So we feel that we're analyzing the microbiota as well, and how the microbiota would respond to the constant barrage of sugar. And for humans, you say, well, our microbiota in the intestine doesn't see the sugar. 
But actually, we have bacteria starting in our mouth going all the way down our digestive tract. So it does have human implications. Interesting, very interesting. I have to say, uh, to tell a story. So over the weekend, I met with a couple of my friends, scientists, and uh, one of them was a, a guinea pig for the experiment that uh, Aran Siegel in the Weizmann Institute done on uh, continuous glucose monitoring okay. and uh, trying to understand what food increases it and what food doesn't increase it in, uh, wow. in human. So, so they, they've been in the, so he recruited a lot of uh, students in the Weizmann Institute. And they started to measure what what each uh, uh, food item doing to their uh, glucose peak. Right. And what they found that uh, every time that they uh, went into and ate uh, uh, something in the restaurant in the Weizmann Institute, they have seen a big peak of uh, uh, of the glucose. And they didn't understand what happening. They ate at home; it was a, fl- a, a nice peak. They they ate outside, <laughs> but every time that they went to the restaurant in the Weizmann, they had a huge peak. So what they uh, they done? They came to the restaurant in the in the Weizmann Institute and asked, "What is going on? Why every exactly. time that any uh, any person going to the restaurant get a, a huge peak?" And what they realized that uh, the chef there decided to add sugar to everything. Wow. So in every meal they, they, had, they had sugar. So not surprised. Funny story about how even in the uh, one of the best institutes in the world, right. <laughs> the, the chef there uh, pour sugar on the meal. And not funny. With the the so did they eat more as well? Because we find that probably like in humans, you eat a little more if it tastes good. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the, the rest of the story, but it was funny to find that they, in the Weizmann Institute you, you get uh, uh, they pour sugar <laughs> like crazy on the on the food of uh, the the student and the uh, and the scientist. Wow, um, that poor chef he yeah, probably yeah, never that. expected to be in a research study. He <laughs> <laughs> tried to hide it and uh, get like a five star in the <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But yeah. I hear uh, that so, they're using those glucose monitors in people for diabetes, like for people yeah. to understand their blood glucose and maintain blood glucose levels. Yeah, and correct. And currently, uh, there is a lot of uh, that. Now it's in fashion that people, normal people, are also doing that and trying to to find what food increases it and what food is not. Right. Uh, but I think that that's a a, a subject for a. Um, Not for a me, completely yeah. different podcast. Yes, uh, I, did, I think that it, it was a, a, a pleasure uh, um, learning so much from you about uh, um, the early days of longevity, uh, especially at uh, the Gary Rufkin Lab and Lenny Gawanta Lab, which are basically the founder of the aging process and discussing uh, Cynthia Kenyon as well, which is maybe the founder of the aging research. Well, so, so that was great. Th- let me just interject. Tom Johnson originally found age one and no one was interested in it. But when Cynthia found DAF2, it showed that there were two genes and then people got interested. So. Yeah. T- thank you for doing that. And uh, I think that Ashley have a couple of more uh, questions or point to communicate. Yeah. So we like to wrap up all of our episodes asking if you would be willing to share one decision that you make each day based on nutrition, longevity, maybe your own research that you can share as a tip for our listeners to expand your health span. Yeah, yes. Well, for me, I mean... It's always been keep your mind and body active. And so for me, I challenge my brain every day by doing different things. And that's what I do. But the other thing I have to say is I really watch my sugar intake. Hmm. So I have no sugar in my coffee every day. That's the one thing that I have changed is no added sugar. So I never add sugar. And even now, when I bake, I look for sugar alternatives. So Heidi, when you when you are traveling to the Weizmann Institute, don't go to the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit, when you said about Googling images of older people looking on a computer playing tennis, my mind automatically put a worm looking at a computer trying to play tennis. So staying <laughs> active. <laughs> That is now burned into my mind. <laughs> well, we can't um, ask them, you. Ashley. We can't ask them. So we have to, uh, you know. 
Maybe that's a maybe that's a good essay. Can they focus on a computer screen for long periods of time? <laughs> but thank you so much for being here, and I just love to echo Gil and that I learned so much about those earlier well, times in the longevity field. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Awesome, and we you, look Ivy. forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientist. For more information, please go to www.insighttracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.